I invite you tonight to take a look at uh, Ezra. The book of Ezra, it's actually not one hour, one book tonight, it's two books. Ezra is literally two stories, almost 80 years separating them. And one through six tells the story of Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel and their return, which happens between, let's say, about 536 BCE. Almost 80 years later, Ezra comes back, and actually chapters 7 through 10 are a different book. So how did they get snapped together? Well, part of Ezra's life story is he's a game changer for the Bible. Many of the books of the Hebrew Scriptures that you have all put together the way they are now. For instance, Isaiah. Most of us believe were put in their final form by Ezra. He's an incredible scribe, and he's the guy who actually compiles the books and helps us to have much of the work the way we have it today. Well, along with that, he took an earlier record from Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel and snapped that scroll onto one that had his name on it. And we have the book of Ezra in 10 chapters, but it's actually 1 through 6 and 7 through 10. Both of these stories have one thing in common. And since all of us blow it at some point in our lives, uh, we make some critical decision that's a real boneheaded move, all of us love the idea of recovery. And both of these are recovery stories. I want you to consider for a minute that some things don't have do-overs. When, when I was working in the computer robotics industry, I was a um, manufacturing assembly guy. And uh, for a while, they moved me off the floor. I don't know how these things work. I'm not an electrical engineer. I can wire to print. That's what I can do. If the print says put it there, I'll put it there. But uh, after a while, what they did was give me the opportunity to move out of that shop and move into the engraving shop and eventually into the training shop. Now, in the engraving shop, here's what I learned. I had to engrave aluminum panels. And if I got it wrong, if I slipped, at the end of a panel, a week's work on that anodized aluminum was thrown in the trash, and I started again. If I engraved the things in the wrong places, someone could lose an arm or even their life. Because you got to get the switches and the tags correct. If it's not done right, it's dangerous. What I learned from that process is that some work requires incredible concentration, and some things don't have do-overs. Engraving is something that doesn't have a do-over. Now, things like that help you understand why second chances are so attractive. So Ezra is a book about two stories of second chances. That's true, by the way, in our spiritual life and was true of ancient Judah. And that's what this book aims itself toward. This book of the Bible gives you a story of what happened to God's people when they woke up one day and found themselves in captivity and God gave them another chance. Now, to set the stage for Judah's failure, let's just quick skip a stone across the top of the pond and get us to chapter 1. By the time you're at chapter 1, God had already set up a kingdom, first under Saul, then David, then Solomon, and that kingdom eventually split, but he had given them a temple, he had given them instructions in the law, he had told them how they could be a light to the nations, and they promptly weren't. Then... When the people rebelled, he sent them prophets and asked them to change direction, and they ignored them. So then he split the kingdom, north and south, and under uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam, the kingdom split in 928 B.C., and even though God brought this tension between cousins and brothers, they missed the cue of discipline and kept right on sinning. God brought plagues, punishing defeats, major armies, they yawned and continued in disobedience. God took the northern kingdom, their cousins, and took them into Assyria and into a, a foreign land and wiped out their capital at Samaria in 722 B.C., and they deepened their sinful practices. And God sent yet more prophets to them, telling them, you got to stop, you got to stop, Judah. I have a temple in Jerusalem. You can honor me. And they didn't. And so it came about that finally God carted them off into Babylon. And in 586, they woke up one day with all of the rest of the great men taken to Babylon. It's been going on since 606, 597, 586, three waves, and now they wake up in Babylon and they don't know what they're doing there. 70 years passes. 
And finally, the long, dark tunnel of captivity looks like it's about to end. And just about that time, God raises up onto the throne Cyrus the Great, who's a game changer by historical means. Uh, he's so important to the world's understanding of change of history that if you visit the United Nations building in New York, you will see a copy of an edict that was made, a cylinder with all sorts of little um, um, writings on it that are essentially Cyrus sending people back home. See, he was a game changer in that up until Cyrus, when he takes a throne and he decides about 559 down to 530, he's going to be the ruler of the, the known world at that time. Cyrus finds himself doing something no one else thought of. Everybody thought when they took you over, what they needed to do is put you in chains and drag you to their homeland. Cyrus thought, you know, we got a lot of people running around from lots of different homelands. Let's send them all back. In fact, let's give them some religious rights and let them get their own temple started. And one of those subplot stories is Ezra. And one of those subplot stories is found in Ezra. It's the Shesh Bazar and Zerubbabel story of them being sent to build up the temple of the living God. By the way, the one in the United Nations is a copy of the one in the, in the British Museum. And it's not about the temple of the living God. It's about a temple of Marduk. See, he did the same edict to lots of different people. The one we have is from the Bible. It's about the Jewish people. Now, eventually, you end up with the Persians rising, and you have Cyrus the Great, and he becomes an important figure. But what's important for me is when I open up Ezra chapter 1, I see that God is about to begin a restart. A, 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 a reset button is about to be pressed. So when you drop into chapter 1, I want you to see that there are six different signs that a second chance moment is coming up. And it's just beginning. How do you know when God's giving you a reset? I mean, it's great that he does, but how do you know when it's happening? Well, chapter 1, verse 1 opens up with a word about preparation. You have to tune yourself to see the major events of the world as part of God's continuing work. Look at verse 1. It was the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord. Do you see it? We started off in the woodshed because of our own disobedience under Cyrus. We started off in Babylon when the Persians had taken it over, but God was at work. Even though they didn't see God's hand at work in their lives, even though they didn't like it, they had to come to recognize that as God was about to work in their life, that he had been doing something all along. And so verse 1 simply says that even though they found themselves in the place of judgment, God wasn't done with them yet. You have to know that God is still working in your life for you to understand that a second chance is about to be sent your way. The second thing I notice is in verse 2, and that's that there was a recognition, biblically speaking, that God often uses unregenerate man to do his work. We have to remember that. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord of heaven, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of this earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. That exact wording is used of lots of other gods, too. See, Cyrus was a fill-in-the-blank kind of guy. He was like, whichever group you're from, yes, I'm for you. Go home, build your temple. I'll pay for it with, with state tax money. Now, we only have the one record, but later have found archaeologically the other records. And here's what I think is interesting. God is not at a loss of options when it comes to being able to use people. He doesn't need Washington to start following him before he starts using them. He already is. Brussels? Yeah, God's got that one. Beijing? Yep. Tehran? Yep. God is working through all of those people, whether they want him to or not, whether they recognize he's doing it or not. Cyrus thinks he's speaking, but he's echoing the words of what God once done. So let me just say it this way. You're not ready for God to give you a second chance until you understand that he's in control of what's going on and that he can move people that don't even know he's moving them. And when I get down to verses 3 and 4, here's what I see. I see a third thing. We have to expect to materially support the calls to obedience of God's revealed word. When God says something, when God reveals something, when God calls on something to get done, he's not going to do it free of charge. Oh, you say, but God works free. No, 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 no. God is expecting us to show up and materially support what he's doing in our lives. 
If God wants to give you a job, you might want to put in applications. You might want to get out of bed. I mean, it's possible somebody's going to come to your bedroom, knock on your door, walk in, and get, offer you a job, but it's not highly likely. So verses 3 and 4 simply say that, that as they were given the opportunity, there were two kinds of people. Look at verse 4. Every survivor, wherever he may live, he can take silver, gold, goods, cattle, and together with a free will offering, they can offer it for the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Here's what he says. If you are able, go, build it. If you're not, give an offering. But either way, materially support this. When God offers a second chance, material support is part of the process. Now, it's interesting because when I get in verses 5 and 6, I see a fourth thing. There's a comprehension involved here that active support has to come from leaders before it comes from followers. And here you see it in verse 5. Do you see the word heads of fathers, households of Judah and Benjamin? In other words, it literally says that in order for God to get started with the people, that the heads of the families were called on first. Expect if you're a leader and God is about to open up a second chance that he's going to knock on you and the word is whose spirit God had stirred to go up. He's going to start stirring in leaders before he starts committing all of the followers because that's part of the job. There's two more ideas. We did four, but I told you there were six. The last two, well, one of them comes from verses 7 through 10. <coughs> it says, um, expect God to supply what believers cannot when they're following his lead. See, God says, I'm going to open a door to you. I'm going to send you back. I'm going to ask you to take up a, an offering. And they did. After they did, it says that King Cyrus brought out the articles of the house of the Lord. They, they took the offering of what they could raise, and then God gave them what they couldn't. God did for them what they couldn't do for themselves. But first, they had to put their money on the line. Then God showed up with all the things that were back in the storage room that he's been holding on to. By the way, this isn't an inventory. I know when you read, it says like in verse, oh, verse 9, now this was their number, 30 gold dishes, 1,000 silver dishes, 29 duplicates, 30 gold bowls, 5 golden rings. You know, it sounds like it's some kind of inventory. It's not. It's a celebration. I just want you to remember one last thing before you leave chapter 1. God knows what's his. Put it in a foreign land, stick it in the back room. God still knows how many there were and that they belong to him. God's stuff is God's stuff. And here, the whole point of chapter 1 is this. When God is going to offer a second chance, when he's going to open a door for a reset button and give you an opportunity again, the thing I want you to remember about it is you need to be able to recognize it, and then you need to be able to respond properly. And if you don't watch the model of Ezra 1, you might not know that he's doing it. Flip over to chapter 2. And what happens when they are making their way out? Chapter 2 tells the story, and I simply use the, the word for chapter 1 as preparation, but chapter 2 is the word team. If I have a single word on it, it's the assembly of a team. Chapter 2, verse 1, just gives you a kind of a redux to tell you where you are in the story that Cyrus has sent them back, that they've now been given the opportunity. And then verse 2 starts a list of names that you probably skip when you're reading the Bible. Don't. Okay, chapter 2, verse 2, starts with a list of 11 leaders that are mentioned, each one by name. Now, first there's the team leader, that's Zerubbabel. And second, there's somebody with expertise in the area. In this case, it's Jeshua or Joshua. He's a priest. If you're building a temple or rebuilding a temple, a priest would be good to have with you. Somebody who's spent their whole life learning what the temple functions like and how it's supposed to be. So somebody knows the job. By the way, the council of leaders that it goes on after that, Nehemiah, Sariah, the other people that are on the list, I suspect that some of those are construction people. I suspect that if you're going to do a building, you might want to have somebody who knows, you know, how buildings work. So the very first thing they do in chapter 2 is assemble a team. And then beyond that, in the end of verse 2, all the way through uh, oh, wow, all the way down to verse 35, there's these names and numbers, sons of so-and-so and a number, sons of so-and-so and a number. These kinds of passages, unless you like statistics and genealogies, make you want to hurt yourself, right? But really, there's a point to it. Don't forget that part of this 
is that this has to be God's record for the people. They have a purpose. The record is going to help people have their essential history and land contracts are going to be written into the scriptures. There's something bigger than that. If you don't have a note like this in your Bible, make one. It's, uh, it's this. Our faith, more than any other faith, the Judeo-Christian faiths are rooted in actual, verifiable history and documentation. Islam is a series of stories that you can't pin to anything historical. Gautama, the Buddha, was talking, but you don't know where he was or whether it was a Tuesday or whether things were going well or not. You have no context to date or to work with those texts. But we have this verifiable text that is rooted in the land and has all kinds of ways of verifying the history. And so I think that's important to remember. By the way, if you check Numbers, uh, uh, Nehemiah, I'm sorry, Nehemiah chapter 7 cross-references this list and has a different number of people. You know why? Some people changed their minds. They signed on, but they didn't go. And that's always going to be the case, by the way. There's going to be a lot of people who really are going to want to know a foreign language, and they're going to want to take the class, and about three classes in, they're going to drop out. And, you know, if wanting it were making it, that would be wonderful, but that's not how it works. By the way, they took along with them not only the, some, some, some leaders, but they also took along with them some intercessors. Look at verse 36. Circle the word priests there. They took on some people who would stand for God on their behalf. But By the way, down in verse 40, they also took on people who would be models for them. Those are Levites. God spread them out through the people so that they would model what he wanted them to be like. And so uh, uh, they also took along, look at verse 41, circle the word singers, worship leaders, lifters. See, when God is going to get something going in your life, you're going to need leadership in your life. You're going to need... You're going to need uh, lifters in your life. You're going to need intercessors in your life. You're going to need models in your life. It's, it's very hard to come from a pattern of darkness into a pattern of light. You're going to need a team. Sometimes in the gospel, somebody walks up to Jesus and needs healing and he heals them. But sometimes they can't walk up to him. So four friends pick them up, put them on a pallet, take them up to the roof and dig a hole in the roof and drop them down. In other words, for some of us, it took an entire team of, to get us to Jesus, okay? Here, I would say sometimes it takes an entire team to get a, a reset going on in the dark life. Uh, I, I'm interested because in chapter 2, verse 43, did you notice the word temple servants? I'd circle that one too. These are servant-hearted people. You're going to need a lot of those in your life if your life's going to turn around. Because I don't, know if, I don't know if I should say this openly to you. I don't know if you'll take this well but you're not as big a bargain as you think you are. And you're going to need some people that love you in spite of who you are some days. And I need them, and God has blessed me with them. I noticed also that if you look all the way down in verse 64, it says the whole assembly numbered 42,360. And then verse 65 says, besides their male and female servants, and then it starts number them. I looked at verse 68, and it said, some of the heads of fathers' households, when they arrived at the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered willingly for the house of God to restore it on its foundations. According to their ability, they gave to the treasury, and then it gives some whopping amounts of what they gave. Here's what I see. You're going to also need support. If you're going to pull off a, a change of life, you're going to need some supporters. And God provided in verses 64 to 70 some people. Some of them had a title. Some of them didn't. Some of them had property. Some of them didn't. Some of them had money. Some of them didn't, but they were all on the same mission. And I got to tell you that having pastored churches for a long time, this is one of the joys of what God is doing. He will take he will, you walk into a room and you will know your people well enough to know there's no rich people there and they will come up with an amount that will stagger you for something God has laid on your heart. So that's a short list of the people that we dare not um, neglect. But get down to verse 59 because we're not done with this chapter. Chapter 2 also says there's some people that shouldn't be allowed to, to do what they want to do. In every work of God, there's going to be some self-appointed leaders who think they're really good at it who aren't called by God to do it. They're going to be the people who think they ought to be leading it 
because the people who are leading it really aren't leading it the way they would lead it. And in verse 59 says, there were also some others that were not able to give evidence of their father's household and their descendants. You got to remember that just as your new birth qualifies you to work within the church because your giftedness comes from your new birth, you get in your salvation also the Spirit of God and the gifts that come with that. Under the old economy, what they had was their literal physical birth. You didn't decide to be a Levite. You were either born a Levite or you weren't. And if you were of the subset that were of the Kohanim, you were a priest or you weren't. And that was by virtue of you being born to that family. So there were some guys who showed up who said, listen, we're, we're part of the team, but they couldn't show their birth certificate. And what's interesting is, nowadays, we tend to not even examine well the people that lead us or the people that write the book that is so impacting to our theology or make the movie that we're ready to get out there and defend because it's Christian, only to find out that the person has abandoned the faith by the time the movie was made. Here's the problem. The problem is we can't just take the people that speak well and let them lead us. That might do for a country, but it's not going to do for a church. And verses 61 to 63 is a, is a really tough passage because some couldn't demonstra demonstrate they had the God qualifications for their office. So here's what happened. They didn't get to do it. What? Somebody wanted to serve God and they were told no? Listen to me very carefully. Yes. Because they did not have the requisite qualifications that God required. Do you think that was by happenstance or do you think God could have gotten the record to show up should he have wanted them in the office? Let's, let's be open to the idea that we've got a God that's running things. And if nobody can find it, there might be a reason. All they would have had to do in chapter 2 to ruin the rest of chapter 2 through 6 and everything they were coming back to do is put the wrong people in leadership because they were the people who really wanted to do it. It's not based on that. It's based on whether or not you're called by God and have the verifying qualifications to be that person. So assembling the right team is essential to getting the whole thing going. Now, let's go to chapter 3, because in chapter 3, what you see is that the enemy has four tricks he's going to pull out. And so I use the word attacks for chapter 3. He's got four tricks he's going to pull out. Now, to set the stage, chapter 3, verse 1 says that the seventh month arrived. And students, you know that the seventh month is the high holy month. So this is going to be important. Three months have passed since they arrived in the land. They got there, they've been there three months, and now it's the high holy days, and so the people gather to Jerusalem in verse 1. Of course they do. They all want to get around and gather because it's now going to be the top of the year, the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. It's going to start the year, and they know that sacrifices will begin timed with the beginning of the year. So this is the moment they've come back for. Verse 2 says, that there was real participation here. Joshua and Zerubbabel together built the altar, and there they were about to sacrifice the beginnings of the second temple. Now, for you, you'd go, but wait a minute, there's not a temple. For a Jew, if the altar's operating, the temple's working. It doesn't matter if the building's not built yet. If the altar's operating, the temple's working. And so they don't need the building. They just need the altar. They need the fire, and it cannot go out. And so what they have is... Zerubbabel stopping as the civil person and Joshua as the priest coming together and they build this altar. The end of verse 2 says they didn't make up the rules, that they did as according to the law of Moses. And they persistently did it. Look at verse 3. They did it though they were terrified of all the people. It, I think it's interesting that although they were fearful of what their neighbors might do as they began, that didn't stop them from doing what they came there to do. You know, honestly, they started the practice of daily sacrifice, they inaugurated the temple functions, and that's the time when the enemy's going to pay attention to what you're doing. When you're moving forward, that's when the enemy's going to jump, and he will by the middle of this chapter. It's interesting because in verses 4 and 5, it says they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths. They did it according to, notice these words, as each day required, the fixed number. 
You see that in verse 4. You see that in verse 5. What they're saying is we were absolutely transfixed with what the Bible said we should do. What a great record for a ministry. We did it because the Bible said so. And, and then it says in verse 6 that they even expanded the record or repertoire all the way from the first day of the seventh month where they began the offerings all the way to uh, um, link it up with 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. So in your Bible, students, you should have next to 3, 6, 1 Kings 6, 1. The timing of Solomon's temple beginning is the same as the timing in 3, 6. In other words, they synced their watches to say, Second temple beginning when first temple began in sync now. And they did it that way on purpose. By the way, their staff reflected some real planning. In verse 8, it says that they decided in verses 8 and following that they were going to need some more help. And so what they did was they took that normal 30 years of age for Levitical overseers and backed it down to 20 years of age. Now why? Well, when life expectancy average was 42, and 30 was the beginning spot, and you're about to build a really heavy, big stone building program, you might want some 20-year-olds on hand. So they're incredibly practical, and they go, you know what we're going to do? We're going to create a way for you 20-somethings to jump on and do this work. And so in, cha in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, you see that they do that. Now, they also put together a celebration that reflects real planning, because in verses 10 and 11, it says they bring out uh, the priests and the trumpets and the Levites and the cymbals and the Asafis, and everybody comes out, and they start doing this incredible singing and percussion, just like Solomon's builders did back in 1 Kings 6 when they la launched the first temple. In other words, they are absolutely trying to make this second temple look exactly like the first one, except for the first one was big and beautiful, and the second one was a pile of rocks with a fire on top with everything broken down around it. But their heart was there. And they were trying to do what God told them to do. And it didn't look like anything. And the world would come by and laugh at what they were doing. But their hearts were God's and they wanted to do it the right way. And that's when the enemy came at them. The first attack wasn't on the young people. It was on the older people. The people with the hair of the almond blossom in verses 12 and 13. And the first attack was discouragement. And they wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house. You know why? Why did looking at the foundation matter? Well, you have to understand something. They, the, the old house outline footprint was going to be the outer limit to the new house. I want you to imagine you're going to build a stone block building, but you're not using mortars. And you're going to have to start real thick walls and then build them in like this. And they're going to get like a, almost like a half pyramid to stand up on both sides. The outer wall then that used to go up straight will now be the outer limit of the, what is going to be an incline. And the inner wall is going to be a lot smaller. In other words, if you use the old footprint, the new building is going to be a lot smaller than the old one. Because they're building from foundation inward, not outward. And as a result, they look at it and they start weeping. And, and here's what they don't see. These who had known of the grand building of before didn't look in the faces of the young. They looked in the stones of the old. And instead of looking in the faces of young people whose hearts were dedicated to get it started, they started weeping because it wasn't the way they remember it. Right after that, you get to chapter 4, verse 1, and verses 1 to 3, there's a second enemy attack. And that attack begins with deception. It says, when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple, they approached Zerubbabel, and they said, let us build with you, for we seek like you. We seek your God. We've been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, which was a dead giveaway. Ever since this secular king that never knew your God was, we've been serving your God. Here's the problem. They came at barely tested leadership. Look what happened. The first attack was discouragement to the older. The second attack was deception against the young, untested leaders. Let us in. Let us join you. And this temptation you will see in ministry after ministry after ministry. 
already discouraged, the older people have no more resistance. They don't care what we think. They don't want to build it the way we built it. They don't like our songs, and they drift to the edges. And then a young, untested leadership gets the enemy's attention, and they try to bring in compromisers. You'll see it over and over again. Oh, that's not enough. In verse 4 of chapter 4, there's a third punch that the enemy lands. This one is distraction. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah. They frightened them from building. By the way, the Hebrew word merapim is the word they relaxed the people. The word discouraged, they relaxed. They distracted them. They got them involved in anything they could. They, they tried their best at a tactic of distraction. So here's what happens. You've never heard of a ministry like this, where the older people get discouraged, the young leaders get tested to compromise, and then the people who are the backbone workers constantly have distractions drawing them away from being able to pull off the ministry. You've never seen anything like that, have you? It's in the book. Satan's not using new stuff. He's using the same stuff that keeps working. And then in verse 5, when that didn't work, they went to the legislature and hired political lobbyists. That's what they did. They hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel in the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, the king of Persia. They had an entire political hacking group dedicated to making sure, slow it down, stop them from doing what they want to do. What do you do? What do you do when you're faced with this constant pain of, of attack on attack, a discouragement, deception, distraction, disinformation? How do you deal with it? Well, you know what? The father of lies, wait for it, brokers in lies. The counteroffense to lies, you ready? The truth. And it's only when people are educated in what the truth is that they can articulate what it is. Are we living in a day when people really know the book or not? Then why do we think the enemy is going to clean our clock? Because if you don't know the book, you don't have anything to answer them with. What I think is interesting is, on the surface of the story then, as you keep going in chapter 4, I want you to notice that, that God is trying to, to pull off something new, and there's a frustrating delay. As a result of the lobbyists, 4.11 says that they sent a letter to the king, to King Artaxerxes. They say, your servants, the men in the region beyond the river, let it be known to the king that these Jews who came up whom you have, from you have come to up to Jerusalem, they are building a rebellious and evil city. They are finishing the walls and repairing the foundations, which, by the way, was really optimistic. They had barely gotten only an altar stood up. They're really getting it wrapped up. Really? We haven't gotten started yet. We haven't even ordered the materials yet. Now let it be known to the king the city is rebuilt, the walls are finished. And when they are, they will not pay tribute, custom. They won't pay you. That's going to damage revenues. Now, let me ask you something. In the disinformation campaign, could I be so polite but so bold as to say, how do they know what's going to happen when it's done? How can they possibly know what's going on in the minds of the other people? This is what we call in, in uh, psychology projection. If we could do it, we wouldn't be sending you tax revenues, so we're sure if they do it, they're not going to send you tax revenues. What's interesting is verse 13. Some of the people believe that they even know the hearts of the others. So it says, let it be known to the king, if the city is rebuilt, they will not pay tribute. But he goes on in, in verse 13. They won't pay tribute, custom, toll. They're getting very specific. By the way, line 17 of their taxes, they're going to lie on that line. How do you know this? How do you know what someone is going to do that you've never even met or barely spoken to? What's interesting is then they use a, a version of selective history. Now, stay tuned, because in universities across our land, you're seeing this. A selective view of history. Look at verse 15. Search the records. You're going to see that this is a rebellious city. It's been damaging the kings and provinces, and they've incited a revolt in the past. Is that true? Yes. Is it the whole story? Not exactly. But see, when you can give tidbits of truth without the context, you can make anything sound like anything. 
And that's what they're doing. People lie with history the same way liars use complex accounting schemes. And that's what they're doing. If you know how to read the reports, you can see that what they're doing is flawed. I was listening to the radio today, my wife and I driving down the road, and this man's giving statistics that are in no way related to his conclusions. And she looks at me and she goes, what do those numbers have to do with that conclusion? I said, nothing, but they sounded like numbers. So people are going to go, well, he had numbers. Yes, but they're unrelated. You know, the price of rice in China will not inform whether chicken's going up or down in Publix this week. But I can give you lots of numbers, and you can be bamboozled by them. I want you to see verse 16. Chapter 4, verse 16. Drawing conclusions far past what they know and stating them as facts. Here's what he says. We inform the king that if this city is rebuilt, the walls are finished. As a result, you will have no possession in the province beyond the river. Great statement. How do you know that? When they finish building it, they're going to secede. All 50,000 of them. Standing up against your millions, they're going to secede. And they're going to be successful because they're going to get away with it. And you've got to be asking yourself, what are you, crazy? Honestly, seriously, Florida is a big state, but we can't secede from the Union and survive. They're going to win. And we know they're going to win. Therefore, we're not going to do it. I think what's interesting is you get down to verse 17, and the rest of chapter 4 is a delay of the building. They effectively caused a delay. How did they do it? They did it with a series of congressional actions. Get down to verse 24 and end the chapter. Then work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased. And I want you to underline ceased. It was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. In other words, long, long delay. Now what do you do at the halfway mark in chapter 5? Well, God moves in. Because <clears throat> when the enemy has landed punch after punch after punch and put a stop to God's work, God takes action. And in chapter 5, there's a storm. Let me show you the storm that's in the Bible. Sheshbazar, Zerubbabel, 50,000 Judahites have moved back. They started. They worked. They're stopped. Some people think it's as many as a dozen years that they are on hold. Zechariah chapter 3 tells you a cross-reference to this story that the high priest that came, Joshua, that he looked really discouraged. And, and Zechariah came along and pulled back the curtain and Satan was lobbing mud pies at him. You don't deserve to lead the... See, sometimes it looks like discouragement, but what it is is a satanic attack. So in the face of all of this, years have passed, there's a generation there that came back, got the whole thing started, and now they can't build. The fire's on the altar, the priests are doing their job, but there's no building. Time stood still. It seemed like God's people were moved to Judah, but they're unable to move forward. They can't get their assigned mission done, and that's where we pick up the story in chapter 5, verse 1. When the prophets Haggai the prophet, and Zechariah, the son of Idu, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah. Look at verse 2. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedek, arose and began to rebuild. You know what God did? He sent his word to the people. And basically it went something like this. Wake up and do what I told you to do. I understand you have this stay on your building permit from the local government. Who do you think runs local governments? local rulers. Who do you think runs them? I, the Lord. I told you to get busy. Get busy. Obey. And then we'll see. By the way, I'm not promising you there won't be a lion's den or a fiery furnace. I'm just telling you that the outcome's up to me. So get back and do what I told you to do. Now, the dark clouds didn't pass. Look at verse 3. It's just about that time that Tatanai, the governor of the province beyond the river, and Shetar Bozanai and their colleagues came and spoke. Who issued you a decree to rebuild this temple and to finish its structure? What's the answer to the question, students? God. But you know how funny that sounds in a secular world? God told me. Except for God told them. And it's interesting. Verse 5 makes a note that the eye of God was on the elders of the Jews. And if you look, you can see obedience on their faces with their hands. But if you look at their heartbeats, they're running real fast because there's uncertainty about where it's going. Chapter 5 
gives you a big, long copy of a letter that's another political ploy. Why? Because the first letter worked really well, so let's write another letter. See, Satan attacks you in the same place he did last time where he was victorious. And so in 5.6, this is a copy of the letter. Verse 7, they sent a report. Darius, peace, let it be known. Verse 8, to the king, we've gone to the province of Judah. Verse 11, they're rebuilding the temple. He gave it into, and, and he says, they're provoking the, they had provoked the God of heaven to wrath, and he gave them into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. King Cyrus issued a decree, verse 13. Verse 16, Sheshbazar came and laid the foundations. Verse 17, if it pleases the king, let a search be conducted in the king's treasure house, which is there in Babylon. And if there be a decree that was issued by King Cyrus to rebuild the house of God at Jerusalem, then let the king send to us a decision concerning this matter. And the simple problem unfolded. They asked for a finding and the king commissioned one. But this time, chapter 6 says that God showed up. Darius issued a decree, 6-1. And what's interesting about that decree is he says, uh, memorandum, end of verse 2, verse 3, in the first year of King Cyrus, there was a decree, and he tells them the size of the temple that was to be rebuilt. He tells them who's going to pay for it. He says, I want you to take the specified return of gold and silver utensils at the command of the king. This is verses 7 and uh, 8. And by the way, in verses 9 and 10, I want you to give them the animals they need for, out of the uh, tax revenues. I want you to, by the way, verse 13, Tatanai, governor, uh, you, you carry out with all, degree, uh, with all diligence uh, what Darius has sent. And by the end of this, the very people that attacked them with letters had it reversed on them, and somebody else got elected, and they have no idea what happened. And they're sitting there scratching their head because a storm came to their life, and I want to ask a question. All right, so there was this long delay, and then God comes through. I mean, what was the delay for? How many of you have had these 11th hour things where God delayed until the 11th hour, then he came through? And you said, God, thank you for coming through. Why the 11 hours? Here's the thing, they got prophets they wouldn't have had otherwise. They not only got that, they got a new finding on the size of the temple, and guess what? They were too small. They had to move the walls out. Before they ever built them, they were building too small. And God said, uh-uh, that's not what I told you to do. And they went back and showed, this is supposed to be a 90 by 90 building, and you got it way too small. Some of the very things that caused the earlier believers to cry, God was answering from heaven. You know how he did it? Okay, let me put the whole button on there for you know a dozen years and let you just sit there. When I come back, I'll tell you what it was I intended for you to do. If that bugs you, you could not have lived as an apostle in the first century because Paul's best work was often done from a prison cell. Sometimes it's not do something, it's just wait right there. Don't do something, stand there. Stand there, stand there. Now when you get to the end of chapter 6, I just want you to see, I love this, because from verses 19 through 22, there's a little tiny story about their renewal. How excited they were. Now, tax revenues were going to flow in. Programs were going to get started. We're going to get this thing built. How exciting is this? And the first book, Shesh Bazar and Zerubbabel's, ends with this. They observed Passover. They purified themselves, verse 620. They, uh, they returned from the exile. They separated themselves. The Lord caused them to rejoice. He turned the heart of the king over to them. Do you see it? This thing started off with God interrupting the news, you're going home, and it ended up with God interrupting and giving them praise because he had given them an opportunity to have victory. Now that's the end of actually the first book, but that's only one of the two books. I want you to go two generations later by turning the page to chapter 7 because there's almost 80 years between the beginning of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 7. And chapter 7 and 8 talk about the return of Ezra, and 9 and 10 about the reforms of Ezra. And I want to make sure we have time to do the end reforms because they're a little bit tricky. So in chapter 7, let me just say this, that if you look at the model of Ezra, here's what you'll see. In 7, 1 through 5, Ezra was a man of a known family with a tracked past. 
And that's important because he's going to take on a tough job. So in verses 1 through 5, I think that's kind of interesting. But, you know, 16 generations had passed between Aaron as high priest and Ezra. And Ezra was coming from a long priestly family. Don't ever overlook the value of a good family. And if you didn't come from one, you can always start one. Because that's really what you can do for your kids. In verse 6 of chapter 7, I think we need to recognize that God invests people with specific skills. Did you notice in verse 6, Ezra was a skilled scribe in the law of Moses? More than your family, your choices have a lot to do with where you're going for God. And this guy chose to work hard at the word, and because of that, God used him mightily. I think it's interesting, it says that in verse 6, second half of the verse, the Lord God had, uh, of Israel had given, the king granted him all the requests that the hand of the Lord was, of God was with him. You know what? There's no substitute. There's no substitute, students, for the work of God in you. There isn't. You can be the most skilled person out there, but if God is not at work in your life, people are going to know that. They're going to see, you know what, I, I look for something specific that God is doing in a person before I'm ready to get on board with their vision. And I have to tell you, in verses 7 through 10, you have to recognize a pattern of right priorities when you choose a, a potential leader. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. Look at it closely. Mark it in your Bible. Ezra had set his heart first to study the law of the Lord. Then, what was his next one? To practice it and then to teach it. Don't miss the order here. Learn it first. Do it second. Talk it third. Can't tell you how many people go in reverse. They know God's will for your life. They just don't know God's will for their life. Now, go down to 7-11, and almost the rest of this chapter is a letter from the king. You know what I was touched by? The last part of chapter 7, this king really admired Ezra. If you want to lead, build a testimony that people can admire. Because you work the testimony after you build the testimony. See, God works in you, then God works through you, then God works for you. He moves the vision first in you, then through you, and then takes it places you can't go for you. So I think it's interesting because at the very end of this chapter, this king goes on and explains in no uncertain terms that, that he really found Ezra to be the upstanding guy that Ezra comes out as. And you know what's interesting? The end of the passage in chapter 7 from verses 27 and 28 is, is Ezra in prayer. It's, it's great that he had this great history of being a man of the law, but you know what? I've noticed that sometimes people who have a lot of stuff going on scholastically, don't have a lot of stuff relationally going on. And sometimes that's true with God. We know all the theology, we just don't talk to God. And this guy ends that chapter in prayer. Chapter 8, I love. Because in chapter 8, it says that God doesn't hold us responsible to do what we can't, but he delights when we do what we're supposed to do. So Ezra, in the first 14 verses of chapter 8, you know what it is? It's a long list of people. You know why? Because Ezra figured out one really important thing about ministry. It's about people. It's about people. And if people aren't the center of it, it's not real ministry. And then in verses 15 to 20, Ezra got the right people together for the work. Here's what he did. He said, I'm coming back. And he's going to do exactly what Shesh Bazar and Zerubbabel did, but he's doing it two generations later. He says, I want to bring people back. I want to go there and I want to get this thing done. It was supposed to be done two generations ago. Let's get it done. There are reforms that need to be made. There are people that need to be put in place. So what does he do? He assembles the people at the river in verse 15, and he says, I didn't find any Levites. And he said, wait, we're not going. I need Levites. So he sent for a series of Levites in verse 16 and 17. He said, we're not going anywhere until we get the right people. Why? God told us to go. He'll just provide the right, well, just call for the right people. You know, sometimes we have not because we ask not. You know what I love? I love that he also called specifically in verse 17 for some people, or, 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 end of verse 16 for people who are teachers. Circle that, teachers. You know why? Short-sighted ministry enables workers. Long-sighted ministry brings teachers so that we can have future workers. And I love that he did that. 
Now, when you get to chapter 9, I have to tell you, in chapters 9 and 10, the last part of this book is one of the hardest parts to understand, the reforms. And there's something that happens in chapters 9 and 10 that happened nowhere else in the Bible, and I challenge you with this as we go through it. There's a, there's a process in chapter 9, and there's, he gets hit with a problem. And then in chapter 10, he solves the problem. And this is a one-off time in the Bible. You will never see anything like this other than chapter 10 of Ezra, where he steps in and literally divorces families. He breaks families. Here's the problem. In chapter 9, he gets there, and it says that um, after he's there, he's in Judah, the princes approach him. And they say that the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the land. They intermarried. They created a series of marriages that should never have been. They're an abomination, it says. They've taken daughters of the people for their wives. The holy race is intermingled with the people of the lands. The point is, God set up a standard for what a marriage was for them. He made a rule. The marriage is between your own people. The world can redefine marriage any way they want. God set up the standard for His people, and that is what they were to do. It didn't matter what the law allowed. It mattered what God said. And so, what does Ezra do? Look at the first two verses of chapter 9. He collects all the information, and he doesn't talk until he gets it. He doesn't start into this hearing it half-cocked, and he goes out there, and he's going to take care of the problem. In fact, it hit him so hard that you see collecting of all the information, he recognizes that some people don't know the word, some people dismiss the biblical injunctions, and some people don't put together that what they did is what's causing their problem. So he starts to identify the gravity of the issue in verses 3 and 4. I heard about the problem. I tore my garden, garment, my robe. I pulled out some of my hair. In other words, this wasn't a good day. I was appalled. You know what the word appalled, shalmame, is? It's destroyed. I was crushed. I couldn't believe it. And he's sitting there surrounding himself with people that when he sees how serious it is, he just, he has no words. You know what's interesting? He surrounded himself with people who revered God. He consulted God's word and he stayed with those people who took it seriously. He was thoroughly invested in understanding the nature of God as much as the nature of the problem. Listen to me carefully. He didn't just react to the problem. He fell before the nature of a holy God. And in the time of crisis, he was as hungry to know God as to know the offense. In verses 5 to 15 of chapter 9, he got alone with God and prayed. And if you haven't read 9, 5 to 15, you need to. He embraces the guilt. Listen to verse 6. Oh God, I am ashamed. I'm embarrassed to lift up my face to you. You know, we see a lot of leaders that deflect responsibility. Does that seem like deflection? I'm embarrassed. You know what I think is interesting? Verse 8. I'm, I'm struck with how he acknowledged grace and thanked God for his goodness. But now for a brief moment, grace has been shown from the Lord our God. Even in our bondage, verse 9, God has not forsaken us. Verse 10, listen to this. What can I even say after this? I feel so bad. I feel like we're so wrong. I don't even have words for this. Verse 10, second half of the verse. We forsook your commandments. You should write in the word again. We forsook your commandments. Again. You know, maybe the 70 years wasn't long enough. He says in verse 13, you, our God, have requited us less than our iniquities deserve. Shall we again break your commandments and intermarry with the people? You know what? He flatly takes responsibility. And in verse 15, he says, Lord, you're righteous. We are before you in our guilt. No one can stand before you because of this. This is one of the great repentant prayers of the Bible. But I'm going to tell you something right now. That's not going to do it. Sobbing before God about how wrong you are doesn't make any difference unless you're going to change direction. There is a, a guilt that follows doing wrong. But God's not trying to lead you to guilt. He's trying to lead you to Him. 
So, so verses 1 and 2 of chapter 10, he comes in, and while Ezra was praying and he was making confession, he was prostrating himself on that floor of the house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, children gathered, and the people wept bitterly. We've been unfaithful. It's interesting, at the end of verse 2, yet now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. I wonder why they felt there was hope. I, I want you to know that they had already seen God redeem them and gave them a reset back at the time of Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel. They hadn't seen it again now with Ezra coming. God wanted to speak. They needed to hear. And it wasn't enough to just pull off religiosity. They needed a walk with God, and they were going to do it according to what God said. Ezra attempted to start a wave of complete repentance. He wept bitterly, and leaders stepped forward, and they spoke. There was a call to repentance. That's not just a, a, a call that we've done wrong. It's a call to end bad behavior. So in verses 3 to 12 of chapter 10, Ezra called on the people to openly commit to difficult changes. But look at how he did it. Instead of wallowing in pain, godly sorrow leads to deliberate life change. And it says, so now, verse 3, let us make a covenant with our God to put away the wives and their children. Ezra arose in verse 5 and made the leading priests, the Levites, and Israel take an oath. He didn't just say, listen, we're going to do something about this. He made it specific and then made them promise they would do it. And he even told them a time limit because he knew they would put it off as long as they possibly could. Now listen to me very carefully before I close this book. All around the world, people think they have the right to weigh in compassionately to outvote God on his word. They think that they're more compassionate than the God who made us. Because wouldn't this split up homes? Wouldn't children be left without fathers? Yes. But you know what? When you venture down a road and you care nothing for what God has said something should be, you will pay a price for that. The people needed to be led to a specific point of change. In verse 7 and 8 and 9, he says, we're going to make an assembly, we're going to come together, in three days we're going to take care of this. And the rest of chapter 10 is all about how he executes a clean division of these families. Am I comfortable with that? Absolutely not. Can, can I tell you what else happened? He found out three days wasn't enough. So he kicked the football down a little bit. He actually lengthened the time, and some of his conservative leaders turned on him and said, you're compromising, because he found out three days wasn't enough. Here's a guy trying to pull off what God wants done, and some people got a spirit of protector, like they were the secret leader that really knew what God wanted and turned on God's man. I have observed in ministry for more than 30 years, I have observed that all of the phenomenons we're talking about in this book go on in local churches. Here's what I know. There are practical hurdles that needed to be considered, but you know what? I'm going to tell you this. I mean this with nothing gets fixed when God's standards are set aside. Nothing gets fixed when God's standards are set aside. So two books. The scroll of Sheshbazar and Zerubbabel, chapters 1 through 6, now called 1 through 6 of Ezra. And then the scroll of Ezra, about 80 years later, and that would be chapters 7 through 10. Mm -hmm.